So let's start with data structures. So up until now, we've seen many things, uh, variables, for instance, functions and loops that make programming simple or possible at least. Uh, but now we're going to see a little bit more of an advanced type of data. So we've seen up until now variables and types. So types are things like integer, doubles, booleans, as you can see here. And those will tell the compiler how big a particular piece of memory needs to be reserved. For instance, 8 bytes um, or 1 byte for a character, for instance. And what is possible with them? You know, what possible operations we can do? So if height and width are both integers, then the compilers know that uh, each integer is 4 bytes. So 4 bytes need to be reserved somewhere in memory for this particular integer. And that with that particular integer, or with that variable, um, uh, you can do certain operations, like multiplication of two integers. That is legal, that you can do. Now, we see also that functions returns types. Um, and a function can only return one particular value. And a function must always have a return type. And if not, um, you can still have voids which means explicitly saying that there is no return value. Now, the built-in types that we've seen up until now are the elementary, simple, or prim primitive types. Things like float, or double, or bool, or integer, or character. Those are things that are very interesting to have up until now for playful programs as we've seen them now. But for most real-world problems, you need actually sets of these. Um, so if you have uh, things like databases or data from sensors that need to be stored, usually you cannot represent data like that with the elementary things that we've seen up until now. For that, we need to aggregate multiple uh, variables of one particular type, for instance, of float or a character, or as we've just seen in the previous part um, of uh, uh, screen characters as with a Game of Life example. And for this, we're going to first see arrays and afterwards structures and the widening of structures classes. Right. An array is basically a numbered collection of data elements that are all of the same type. Um, and the number of elements is also the size of the array, therefore. So we have, for instance, here in this case, 25 elements that are each a long integer. Now a long integer, long uh, for short, is basically a piece of memory that is reserved for an integer. It is four bytes long and now that we have 25 of those, uh, we can basically treat them as an array, just as we've seen the array in the game of life. So instead of saying long a, we basically say long a and then between square braces we have the number 25, which is the size of the array. Now, if your size of the array is 25, that means you can hold 25 longs in this array called A. And you can index these individual longs or long integers as, uh, the, as something that is between the square braces as well. So A1 in this case holds the second element or element 1 which holds four, a four, four byte number. And in total, what happens as soon as you type in this here, the compiler reserves in memory 100 bytes or 25 times four uh, bytes to hold 25 long integers. That is what happens uh, in this example over here. Now, a little bit confusing might be that we always start at zero over here, um, but that is the way in computer science, often things are counted. So the first element of this array A is at A0, and the index therefore always starts at 0, and goes all the way to 24, or the size of the array minus 1. Now, array elements are therefore accessible via their index. So if you want to get a particular element out of the array, we basically just use the square braces and uh, the index of that. So if we want to access the fifth element of A, 
then we do a4 because it starts at 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So the fifth element then can, for instance, hold the number 42 or the value that is stored in this long um, integer array. And we can also use particular variables to do this. For instance, we can here assign um, the the i'th element of uh, our array a, the value of the i plus 1th element. So if i is in this case a variable that stands for 4, um, then the fifth element over here, so a4, equals then the value of the sixth element, or a5. Now for an array the size of, uh, of size n, you have to have indices that go from 0 to n minus 1, therefore, because the smallest index is always uh, 0. That means that if you identify a new type of array, for instance a character array, so an array C of size 3 and of type character has then three characters, C0, C1 and C2. Uh, C2. And this is basically just something that you have to get used to um, and is in a way quite logical. Um, so it, however, it can create these fence post errors because what you hold in the array cell is basically either given by what you have over here or what you have over here. So we use in this case the fence posts instead of the fences itself. So instead of saying we have a fence with 10 partitions, each a meter long, we basically define this each partition with the fence where it starts at. So at 0, at 1, at 2, etc. So we use these over here all the way to 9, to 9, rather than um, using the cells in the, in, the, in the middle. And that also means that if you have uh, 10 items in your array, you can actually access um, uh, a, a 10, not really, because for that you have to declare the array with 11 elements. The problem, however, is that the compiler will never check whether one of those indices that you give to the array is correct or not. This might seem ludicrous now in our current uh, modern programming languages, but in C and C++ this was kind of a feature and not a bug. In this case you were able to um, deal with lots of things and have lots of power to you by just providing any indices uh, that you could think of. Um, and therefore it is actually possible to read and write non-existing array elements. So if you define an array of size 10 and you try to access the 12th index or the 50th index, what you actually access in that case is another part of memory that is not allocated to you at the time. This, however, has been the source of loads of errors ever since. Um, but this is the way it is actually done on the lower level in a computer. And this is then also how it is represented in C and C++. Now, in the best case, your program crashes because your operating system has reserved the space and you cannot write or read outside the space. But it could also mean on certain platforms that you get very strange effects. In this case, you can actually use the assertions that we already seen, but there are other ways as well. More about it later. Now, to initialize an array, you can actually first declare the array, for instance, int, int array 5, and then the semicolon, and then you can uh, initialize it later, just as we've initialized the two-dimensional array we've seen at the Game of Life earlier. But you can do this in one go, just like we can do this for um, normal variables. So if you have a, a variable for an array, so in this case uh, of five integers, we can immediately initialize those with the curly braces. Then we have to, of course, be sure that we also supply five elements in this case, and that those are integers of the right type. Now, in this case, we don't have to provide the size because we already provide a size over here. And what happens then is that the array automatically gets the correct size. Now, inside a program, there is a way of finding out the actual size uh, within the program at the runtime. For this, a particular trick um, uh, exists where you can say where you can use the size of function. The size of function returns 
the size of a particular element or a particular variable in bytes. So therefore, you usually have to divide it uh, by the size of one particular element as well to get how many instances you have of an array length. So if an, an, uh, an array length was an integer, so four bytes, it basically returns the size of integer times four in bytes divided by the size of one particular element, which in this case is four. And this will allow you to say immediately what your array length is, even if you didn't supply, supply it yourself, if it's a piece of another code, uh, of another code perhaps. Now, as we've seen already, you can define multidimensional arrays. In that case, we just have two subsequent indices that we always supply. Um, the indices uh, or for initializing, um, for creating an array, we use the size between the, the braces, as we can see here. And for accessing one particular element, we use that exactly the same as well. Now, when we use arrays as function parameters, something strange happens. And this is something that is really important to keep in mind. Now, we've seen earlier that if you supply arguments or parameters to a function, then th those parameters are copied. So we take the value of those, uh, of those parameters and we assign them to a new type of, uh, of uh, variable. Those can have exactly the same name, but even though they might have exactly the same name, we basically just copy the value and that's it. That's why swapping, for instance, didn't, was not a possibility. However, when we have arrays as function parameters, we can do this. And this is what we'll show here. So if we have our usual swap function here, where we don't return anything, so we have uh, we define a function of name swap, which returns nothing, so voids, and which has as a fun as a parameter um, an array instead of just a normal um, variable seen by the size of the array in this case, we can actually take two, um, two variables to signify where we want to do the swapping between i and j as indices. We can actually do this. We can basically have a temporary variable first in which we store the value of ai, and then ai gets then the value of I, aj, and then aj gets the value of this temporary variable. So in essence, we have swapped the values of AI and IAJ in this case. And in this case, when we exit the function, those values stay indeed changed. We haven't copied this entire array over here into a new array, then swapped those. And as soon as the, we exited the function, everything was lost. No, in this case, when we add an array as a function parameter, we actually give the the exact array uh, true. And when we change something, we exactly have changed this as well. So this is a valid way of implementing the swap function. So in that case, arrays as parameters are passed by reference. What this means we'll see later, but it means that we don't copy this entire array. We give the actual array along with the function. And if you change this particular array in the function, it will change, it will be left changed when we exit this function again afterwards. And this is called by reference instead of called by value as we've seen earlier. Now if you want a formal parameter in a function you can you don't always have to tell it what size it is. In that case you can actually say that a, an array has a, a non-specific size like this. However you have to be very careful as we will see later. Now here is an, an example where we use a character array called greeting. We use it uh, in such a way that we don't have to specify the size immediately because we initialize it to uh, an array of the elements big H, small e, small l, another small l, another small o, and then something that's called slash zero, which is kind of a demarcation to say this is where this particular array ends. This is exactly the same as an actual zero, so without the single quotes. Now this marks the end of a string, and we can use it as such as well. This will be exactly the same as saying character 
of name a character array of name greeting and greeting is basically initialized as hello now this is what we've been doing the whole time already we've been using strings so everything between double quotations uh, all the time already and this means that we in this case in C and C++ have an array of characters in this case of six six why we have the five characters that we have here but as soon as we use something with double quotations we assume that it's always ended with this delimiter that says now the string is at an end now C++ provides string classes in the standard library so IO stream for instance uh, but not in the language itself that means we always have to include this as a library now, here is the naive approach how to input character arrays. We basically have our character array of size 80, which we call buffer. And then we can, as we've seen earlier, just uh, ask for user inputs and say in the terminal, we input now everything that we get from the user in buffer. The problem here is that as the user starts uh, typing, uh, the reading will stop as soon as um, a white space character is typed. And that is just because of the way C in works. And this could also lead to buffer over, uh, overruns, etc. So this is not a nice way of putting things into character arrays. A nicer way is to use the function cin.get, where we say that we are getting a, an array of size 80, and the array is called buffer. And this means that we read at most 79, uh, 79 characters because the size is, uh, is 80 of the string, but of course this last element needs to be uh, this particular character. And this will make sure that we can read until um, uh, the actual input is given. So we, we actually read 79 characters and then this particular character is concatenated. Now, up until now, we've seen this C in, and we didn't really understand what this was. Now, this is something that will come very soon in this object, in this um, uh, chapter still, because C in is an object, not a function, and get is a member function of this particular object C in. It's called a method. This we will see later, but up, but uh, slowly this will um, this will be clarified. Now, the final thing we're going to see is structures. Now, structures is kind of an archetype of a class. A structure is, just like in an array, you can combine several elements of the same type. In a structure, you can contain several elements that also belong together. And those we group together in something that is called a struct. Um, it is a collection of member variables, we call it. And those can be of different types. They don't have to be. So in this case, we have the example complex for a complex number. You might know this from mathematics, that a complex number is a collection of two um, real numbers. A real part or uh, two numbers, uh, one a real part and one an imaginary part. And we can um, uh, depict these as doubles. So here in this case, we have a double variable called uh, array for the real part and a double variable which is called im for imaginary parts. And those we group together into one structure, which we call complex. So this whole statement over here defines that from now on, we have something that we call complex, which is a structure that combines this variable and this variable together. Now, once we've done that, we can declare variables of this type. So, and this we do like this. We have a struct complex. That means we have something that we already def declared as a, a structure, uh, and we named it complex. And then we can um, start new variables or declare new variables like x, y, and z. And we can access those member variables, so that real and imaginary number, which is a double, um, by doing uh, this dot operator, using the dot operator. So in this, ca this case, for variable z, we can access the real part by doing dot re. So this is, in a way, exactly the same as having an array where you use the square braces to, uh, to look at the index 
because every element of an area is of the same type. Here for structures, for struct complex, that this is not always the case. And what happens then is that we can, with the dot operator, uh, show um, what happens or which, um, which member variable we need to access. Now, structure types form, therefore, a unit. Uh, a unit, a collection of variables that belong together. Now, it can contain many data elements of different types, but the nice thing about this, uh, uh, the, the nice, the not so nice thing uh, about this, is that the internals are open. Basically, we know that a complex number could be re represented by uh, two doubles. Now, in this case, we also have no functions that can immediately be associated with this. So, very, um, so operators like plus, minus, um, multiplication, division, um, cannot immediately be tied to this structure without grouping those um, in a very unclear, non-transparent way. So because of this, we're going to see next time the concept of classes, where we can do this. So classes are in a way nothing else but the but structures, structures where um, we cannot only group different types of variables together, but also different methods and also hide how these things are implemented. But more about that later in the next section.